Today, uh, we're going to immerse ourselves in a story. Those of you that know me well know that you know that I, I know you know that I love stories. I love to read them, I love to tell them, and I find myself teaching using stories. So today what I'd like to ask you to do is get the Pew Bible out from in front of you and turn to page 382, uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, pages 300, page 382. And while you're getting that Bible ready and turning to that page, I would like to share why we're immersing ourselves in this story. Uh, well, you know that we're in the middle of a, a sermon series called Get Over It. And what we're talking about is how God helps us to get over some of the feelings and issues that we as Christians oftentimes, as we as human beings, find ourselves having difficulty getting over. Last week, Pastor Dave talked about guilt and how even though we know that Jesus died on the cross and he took all of our guilt upon his shoulders and left it nailed to the cross, we still want to pull it back on ourselves and we feel guilty about things that we need not feel guilty about. <coughs> Today, we're talking about depression. We're talking about when we are down in the dumps. Now, let me set something straight right up from the beginning. Depression can be very serious. There's depression called clinical depression or psychological depression. Depression that's caused by a, an imbalance of chemicals in our body or traumatic psychological damage that's been done to us in our past. And when we have that kind of depression that lasts for a long period of time and that sense of hopelessness overwhelms us, it's important, friends, for us to get some professional help. And so I implore you, if you are struggling with that kind of depression and you don't yet have a caregiver, I I encourage you to go see a doctor, go see a psychologist. And if you need some help getting on that path, please talk with Pastor Dave or myself or one of our other staff members, and we would be glad to help you in that. But the kind of depression we're talking about today is a second kind of depression. It's like when we're feeling blue. We're down in the dumps. We're discouraged, and sometimes we feel stuck in the life situation we're at. And every one of us feels that at some point in our life or another. It might be caused by, you know, disease or uh, illness of a loved one or the death of a loved one and the grief that we feel. It might be caused by financial setback or it might be caused by too much work and, and not enough play. It might be there because of the fact that maybe we um, just feel terribly alone. Elijah was down in the dumps. Now, it didn't start that way. It started with a mountaintop experience, literally. He was on the top of Mount Carmel in Israel, and he had challenged the prophets of Baal, the false god of the day, to a contest. Each side was to build an, an altar and prepare a sacrifice on top of it and then pray to their respective god and ask him to send fire to complete that sacrifice. And so the prophets of Baal went first, and they prayed, and they prayed, and they failed. Why? Because Baal isn't real. He has no power. And isn't that how we are sometimes in our lives? When we look to things of this world to make us happy. If I've got enough stuff, I'll be happy. If I have a good relationship, I'll be content. And we look to this world, to false things, to complete our sacrifice, but they failed. And then Elijah stood before God and he said, God, prove once and for all that you're God. Let the people of Israel know. Let everyone present know that you are God. And God sent fire, but just not a little one, to complete that sacrifice. He sent a fire that consumed it all. The sacrifice, the wood, the stones, all of the water, buckets and jars filled of wa with water, the trench around the altar consumed all of it by this mighty fire that God sent. Life looked good for Elijah until he got a message from the queen. So follow along with me. 1 Kings chapter 19, page 382, verse 1. Ahab, the king, told Jezebel, the queen, all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. And then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also 
if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. And when he got this death threat, we're told that Elijah ran away in fear. Now, as we read on in this chapter, we're going to be recognizing the fact that, that Elijah was suffering from some of the classic symptoms of depression. First of all, we just heard that he had extreme fear. He ran away. He ran 100 miles away to get away from the queen. The second thing that he experienced was a feeling of hopelessness and no reason to live. We're going to see how he looks to God and says, my life is worth nothing, just take me. We're going to see that he, he had a change in sleep patterns. For some, that's insomnia where they can't sleep and they're restless. But for Elijah, it meant that he got extremely tired, excessive tiredness. We're going to see that he had a feeling of rejection and loneliness. He said, I, even I, am left. Just me. And then finally, we're going to see that this lasted for a long time. It lasted through his entire trip. From Jezreel up north down to Beersheba, 100 miles, and then from Beersheba down to Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai, another 200 miles, 300 miles. It took him a couple of months to travel this, we believe. And that whole time he was feeling this. Elijah was in the dumps. And I'd like to ask you to walk with me his journey. And I'd like you to notice what God did in his life to help to lift him from the dumps, to get over it. So let's go back to verse 4, verse 3. No, excuse me, verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now. O oh Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down, and he slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate, and he drank, and he lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came a second time, and he touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. Now, before we read on and we look at what God did for Elijah, I want you to notice what God did not do. He didn't scold him. He didn't call him out. He didn't say things like, oh, come on, Elijah. Don't you remember what just happened a couple of days ago up on top of Mount Carmel? Come on, Elijah. Don't you remember how I proved once and for all by sending the fire that I am the one true and only God and I am God? Elijah, get over it. Pick yourself up by the bootstrap, your bootstraps and let's get on with life. He didn't do that. Instead, what he did do is he put into a plan of healing. The first thing he did is he nurtured and he cared for Elijah's physical body. Did you notice that he allowed him to sleep? And he sent an angel to watch over him. And he gave him food to eat. And he did this time and again. Folks, I have a friend that works at the emergency room over at Lutheran Medical Center. One of the things that he told me is that of the people that go to the emergency room, 70% of them are suffering from dehydration. Why? Because we get busy in life, don't we? We're doing all the things that we know that we need to do as a responsible citizen, right? We do our jobs well and we work hard. We take care of our families and the home that God gave to us. We're busy doing the Lord's work and sometimes we forget to take care of ourselves. Friends, I want to tell you, it's not a sin to take care of yourself. It's not selfish. Because we can't be of any service to God or to anybody else if we're laying flat on our back, right? So the first thing that God did is he nurtured and he cared for Elijah physically. The second thing, let's read on. Verse 8. And he arose and he ate and he drank and he went on the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Horeb. That's Mount Sinai where God gave his covenant to his people, the Ten Commandments, and said, I will be your God, you will be my people. 
And there he came to a cave, and he lodged in it. Verse 9. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. So the second thing that we see God doing for Elijah is he's helping him to identify and verbalize the problem. In other words, he's inviting him to pray. Inviting him to come to the Lord with his, his hurts and his sorrow and his down-in-the-dumps attitude to pour his heart out to God and to share with him all of his hurts. And I don't know if you noticed, but as Elijah was doing that, he was telling God some things that were half-truths. And some of them that we'll find out are, are downright lies, but God didn't stop him. He just let him pour out his heart. And God invites us to do the same thing, to come to him in prayer, to pour our hearts out before him. And when we're down in the dumps, to share our feelings as raw as they may be. He says, Cast your cares upon the Lord, and he will sustain you. That's in Psalm 55. And then Jesus himself said, Come to me, you who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, for my burden is light. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. In other words, Jesus is inviting us to come to us, to him in prayer, and to dump on him, and he's happy to hear it. And then you know what else he does? He puts us together as his people here. He brings us to church, and he says, support one another and encourage one another. The place where it can be safe, where we can share our hearts and our feelings, and we're accepted and loved. The third thing we're going to find that God did for Elijah was to give him an invitation into the Lord's presence. Verse 11. And God said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper, a still, small voice. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak, and he went and stood at the entrance of the cave, and behold, there came a voice to him that said, Elijah, what are you doing here? God invites us into his presence. He says, you know, when you're down, go to church. Have devotions. Open my word. Let me speak to you. And it, folks, Pastor Dave said it time and time again, if you want to know where to start, open up to the Psalms. Because we see David pouring out his heart in prayer to the Lord and then listening to what the Lord has to say to him and he shares it with us. He says, come into my presence and, and hear what I have to say to you. You know, we're a lot like Elijah, aren't we? We want God to do big, magnificent things. We're looking for the fire and the wind and the earthquakes, right? We want to say to God things like, you know, God, why don't you do something here? Why don't you prove to me and to everybody else once and for all that you are the true God and that you're here? Why don't you do miracles like you did in the Bible times? Where are you, Lord? Why don't you do something? And you know what he says to us? He says, I am here. I come to you every single week in the body and blood of Holy Communion in person so that I can communion with you. I do speak to you and I show you who I am and that I am God in my word. I speak to you in a still small voice, but in here you know my heart, my desire for you, my promises my love, my future for you. 
He comes to us and he says, you want to know about a miracle? About something magnificent? Look at you. Look at little Amara. I made that. I made you. Fearfully and wonderfully made, I have made you. And not only that, but when you were baptized, when I brought you to faith, I made you mine. That's what our God says to us. He is with us. And he is active and in our lives. And God goes on. He identifies and discredits the lies and the half-truths that we tell ourselves. And this is how he did it for Elijah. Verse 14. And Elijah said, I have been very jealous for the Lord and the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've thrown down your altars. They've killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. Now, folks, we're going to see in just a second here that these are half-truths and lies. First of all, yes, there were some prophets that were killed by the sword. Yes, there were some, and many even, that worshipped the false gods. But not all of Israel have, had forsaken God. Not all of them had bowed down, bowed down to Baal. And we're going to find out, too, that Elijah wasn't alone. That there were many that were still faithful to God. And this is what the Lord said to him. Verse 15, Go Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel-Meholah, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. And I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So as God shared his word with Elijah, he revealed the truth. He discredited the lies and the half-truths that Elisha was listening to. And don't we do that oftentimes in our life? When something bad happens, all of a sudden, Our mind is filled with all these what-ifs. What if this happens, how will I do? What if this happens, how will I act? What if this happens, I don't think I can bear it. And we get so overwhelmed with all the what-ifs that we can't see the forest through the trees. And God says, come to me, listen to my word, and let me tell you the truth. Let me tell you the truth. And then there was one more step. After doing all these things for Elijah, God said, now I want you to focus on me. If you go back to verse 15, you see God's first two words to him. He says, go, return. What he's doing is he's taking our eyes off of ourselves and pointing them to him. He's taking our eyes off of our inward focus and helping us to look at others. Years ago, when I was young, I was telling this uh, young uh, group of people up front here that when I came here, I looked like them. Didn't have the gray hair. But every once in a while, I would get down in ministry. I, I was working with the youth, and I was like, oh, the attendance isn't what I want it to be, and, and the kids don't seem to be getting it, and I'm not sure that I'm effective. And, and I would get really down, and I would call my dad. And my dad had been a youth minister, he'd been a pastor, he'd been a teacher and a principal, he knew it all, and so I would call him and he would walk with me. He would tell me, Tim, have you been getting enough sleep? He would say something to me like, you know, Tim, uh, talk to me. And he would just listen, he was a wonderful listener. And then he would invite me into God's presence and he would share God's word with me. And then oftentimes he would identify and discredit the lies and half-truths. He would say, you know, Satan's trying to tell you you're not effective. Satan's trying to get you down in the dumps because he doesn't want you to do his work. But then what he would tell me is this, Tim, when I get down, do you know what I do? I leave the office. 
I leave the church. I thought he was going to tell me, well, I go play golf. But you know what he said? He said, I go to the hospital and I visit the sick. Or I go to a shut-in that can't get out of the house and I share God's word with them. Or I go to somebody's house that I know needs a friend and I serve them just by, you know, being with them and, and loving them. And you know, God lifts me up. Friends, are you down in the dumps? Maybe one of these things, or maybe all of these might help you. Maybe you need to take care of your body a little bit better. Maybe you need to just come to God in prayer and dump your heart out to him. Maybe you need to hear God's invitation to come into his presence, to gather with other Christians, to listen to his word, to spend time in personal devotions. Start your day out that way. Maybe you need to have somebody tell you, no, that's Satan's lie. This is the truth. And God will do that as you open up his word. And maybe you need to get out and to serve. One of my favorite New Testament Bible passages is from Philippians chapter 4. And Paul is talking to some people that are kind of having some disagreements in their church. A couple of ladies are arguing. Things aren't really going too perfectly. And he says, in good times and in bad, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Why? Because the Lord is at hand. He's right beside you. He's with you all the time. And what's the blessing in that? The Lord, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. We can turn and talk to him anytime we want because he's right there. And here's the promise. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Today, we're praying for the cure. There are some that are walking and racing for the cure to raise funds, to encourage and to support people that are struggling with cancer. Yesterday, there was another race. We've got all kinds of illnesses and, and different diseases in our world today. We've got all kinds of things that get us down and put us in the dumps. God says, bring them to me. Ask me whatever you want. We're going to do that in a little while. But he says, do that with thanksgiving. So I'd like to ask you just for a few moments to, of silence just to pour out words of thanksgiving to God. Think about two or maybe three things that you would like to really thank God for. And let's lift them up to our Lord now. Dear Lord, you told us to come to you with the cares of our heart, with words of thanksgiving. Lord, there is so much we can be thankful for, for this life and for all that you've given to us, for all that we have and all that we are has come from you. We thank you for our families and for our family in Christ here at church. We thank you, Lord, for calling us to be your children and for giving us the promise that you are walking with us every step of every day for the rest of our lives, and even into the life hereafter as you bring us into your kingdom and that we could enjoy your presence forever. Dear Lord, we thank you. We thank you for all your goodness and your mercy. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.